Good afternoon. Thanks for that Texas welcome. I'm not used to that. All right, today we're going to take a look at how this technology might impact the way we design our roads. So we need to understand a few things as we get started here. Uh, we're going to take a look at the design vehicle, the driver, and then how these may impact the geometric design. So I'll briefly go through the, the technology part, but we have the, the connected and autonomous vehicles. They have all sorts of sensors. Uh, they have cameras, they have radar, they have GPS. They're communicating amongst themselves, uh, make sure that they're in the right place at the right time. So how are these vehicles going to impact what we do with design? Well, these vehicles are not relying on the human driver. They're, they don't need that input anymore. So we are going to take the human input out, but we're still left with this highway system where we have three pieces. We have the road, we have the vehicle, and we have that road user. And we're going to take that road user out. But we've been designing for the road user for many years. So which road user are we designing for? Are we designing for that one that's a really good driver? Are we designing for the one that makes poor choices, may not be the best driver? We're probably not designing for the absolute worst driver, but we're trying to capture the majority of the drivers on the road. And there's those drivers that are near and dear to us, those younger drivers, we, we love them, but they may have some underdeveloped capabilities, they may lack the best judgment at times, it may impact the way they drive. We also have the elderly or the aging drivers. We love them as well. We're all hopefully going to be there someday as one of them. But uh, they, they're, they're, they start to, to lose the, how well they can see, how well they can hear. Their uh, physical capabilities may be declining somewhat. It may cause them to react more slowly and they may have a slower decision-making decision process. So we're going to have a lot of these younger drivers and older drivers on the roads. But if we move to the connected and uh, autonomous vehicles, we don't have that driver anymore. Now the driver is whoever programmed that sophisticated software for that vehicle and then the vehicle itself. So we saw some of this earlier about the, the 10 controlling criteria. So let's take a quick look at these. Uh, many of these have something to do with geometric design and, and how we're designing our roads. Also threw in their roadside safety because I think that's gonna be a very important aspect of, of how these vehicles may impact what we're doing as highway engineers. I did note that uh, there's two of them there that are slightly different colors. So those are for the, the lower speed roads. The rest would be for the high speed roads. So we start to introduce the autonomous vehicles into the fleet, and does it make a difference if they're mixed in with the traditional vehicles? Or do we try to separate the autonomous vehicles away from the traditional vehicles? Or do we exclusively only have autonomous vehicles? How is that going to change what we do with our design? And then, as this photo shows, we shouldn't just be thinking cars. We could have some big trucks out there, too, that are, or that are autonomous. And we also need to consider the type of roadway that we would be working on or designing. We're going to have high-speed facilities. We're going to have urban facilities. And there might be different things that are influenced by the autonomous vehicles. So what do we think? How many of these might have something related to geometric design that could be influenced by these new vehicles that are going to be on our roads? I think most of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them. So there's a lot of them there. And I don't have t time today to run through all the different things could be impacted. So we'll just take a look at a few of those. The first one I want to look at is stopping site distance. This is a very important aspect of how we design our roadways. So here's the definition right out of the Ashto Green Book. And we're supposed to be providing this specific site distance for our drivers all along our roads. 
and the stopping site distance, it goes into different things that we design. It goes into how we uh, uh, determine the offsets to objects that are along our roadway, which could impact uh, maybe our, our shoulders. Uh, it can impact the vertical curvature. We, we need to have sight distance for our, our vertical curves. Uh, sometimes uh, if we have a, an overcrossing uh, and we have a, it in combination with a sag vertical curve, the, there could be a, a time where that overcrossing could impact the sight line of the driver. When we get into the, the more urban area, uh, we can be looking at intersections. Uh, we might be able to uh, impact the way our intersection uh, uh, sight distance is impacted at our intersections, which could change the way we set up our parking or different objects that may be in the vicinity of an intersection. And maybe at some point, we don't even need to have traffic signals anymore. So let's take a look at those sight lines. So for our horizontal sight offsite calculations, uh, we need to know what the sight distance is, and then we, we, uh, we have a design speed, and we make sure that there's no objects that are within those sight lines. So we, we run through calculations. I happen to work for a consulting firm, and we draw out all our sight lines to make sure that we can see around concrete barriers and bridge abutments and bridge piers and all sorts of other things that might be alongside the road. So right now, when we do the design, we're assuming that the, for stopping site distance, that the driver's eye height is at three and a half feet above the pavement, and the object that we're con concerned about is at a distance of two feet above the, the pavement. But if we're going to the autonomous vehicles, does that change? Can these vehicles, quote, see around objects? If they're based on uh, camera technology? Are the cameras in a different location than the traditional driver's eye? I think some of the answers might be yes. So here's the formula that we use for stopping site distance for a level grade. This is right out of the green book. Uh, this is uh, the same equation that's used in, uh, to develop the stopping site distance tables in the Texas Roadway Design Manual. So if we look at this equation, what are the components that could be the most highly influenced by the autonomous vehicle? Well, there's a couple in this one. Uh, the first one is what is called the break reaction time in this equation. Oh, sorry. This one right here. So it's set up for a two and a half second break reaction time. Some people might call that the perception reaction time or the time to make that decision. The other thing that could be influenced is the, the bottom, the, the deceleration rate. Right now that's set at 11.2 uh, feet per second squared, but we know that uh, most drivers can decelerate at a, a rate that is uh, higher than that. So there might be a, an opportunity to look at an adjusted deceleration rate for these new vehicles. So well, for the, that perception reaction time, Ashto is recommending a two and a half second uh, amount of time for that. Uh, in some conditions where we would have unexpected conditions, we might even add more time on for that. Uh, it might be when we're in a complex roadway situation around interchanges. It might be when we're under construction where you're developing sophisticated maintenance traffic plans. So we might provide a little bit more time. We might actually go into decision site distance. But right now, it's set up at two and a half seconds, and then we might add some more. And then we also have to consider those, those younger drivers, those older drivers. So as, as we age, we might slow down a little bit. We might be more towards the, the higher end of whatever that range is that it takes us to make the decisions to react to something. And then we have those that make poor decisions out there that might be uh, either drinking and driving or using drugs and driving. And that can add even more time on or they might not even be able to, to make the decision. So let's take a look at that formula. So here, I've taken the formula and I've put in uh, the traditional uh, two and a half seconds uh, for four different design speeds. So here is the, 
the t, if, if it's two and a half seconds, then the calculated stopping site distance that we get, and then we would round that up to the nearest five feet, and that's what we would see in the tables in the Ashto Green Book. I didn't do the rounding just so we could see the direct comparison, but let's say the, the autonomous vehicles are able to be a little quicker than a two and a half second person. What if they can do this in one second? Well, if we can do this in one second, then our stopping site distance is calculated. It's decreasing quite a bit based on whatever our design speed is. Now, I have heard some presentations in, in other conferences about how these vehicles are able to communicate 10 times per second. Maybe they're gonna get even faster than 10 times per second. I didn't wanna cut all the way down to, to uh, a tenth of a second, so I went and I just put in a 0.3 seconds, and that's this last column here. And you can see that if we had a, a 50 mile per hour design speed, our stopping site distance is a traditional formula. We have 423, 24 feet calculated for our stopping site distance. We drop it down to one second. We're at 313, 314 feet for our stopping site distance. We drop it down even more. We're down to 262 feet. And technology, maybe that could even continue. Now I mentioned before about the, the deceleration rate as well. So right now we're using 11.2 feet per second. If we then modify that in the equation as well to say 14.8 feet per second, which is what most drivers can decelerate at. And we, uh, let's take, pick the 50 mile per hour design speed again. Here we're at our 424 for our calculated uh, stopping site distance. Drop that down using the, 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 the 0.3 uh, seconds for our time, 262. And if we put in the increased deceleration rate, we're down to 203, 204 for our calculated stopping site distance. So how's that gonna impact us? Well, we've got the horizontal side offsets, we've got the vertical curves. We might not worry about not being able to see around this barrier and glare screen combination. That might be just fine. Maybe we even move it closer to the road. And maybe it, those vehicles can sense if there's something in front of them that they would have to stop for. We might end up designing more for passenger comfort instead of our stopping side distance. This could also impact the widths of our roads. Uh, depending on how well the, the manufacturers can control their uh, autonomous vehicles so such that they stay within their lane, such that they limit the amount of drift or the, how much they move side to side. And then with these vehicles, if we don't have a driver, do we need mirrors? So do those come off the sides of our vehicles? So now we're looking at a vehicle, if the manufacturers can do it, and if it can go straight and stay in its lane, can we start to narrow down the width of our lanes? Can that then save us pavement? So uh, Ashto Green Book has got some uh, values in there for what the, the design widths are that we use for cars and then for the larger uh, trucks and the buses. At some point, it, once we figure out how we can limit that drift down for, for the autonomous vehicles, Maybe we can have lanes that are just a little bit wider than the vehicles themselves. Now this would definitely be primarily for a tangent section. Once we're into a horizontal curve, especially a tighter horizontal curve, we'd have to be worried about the, the overhang of the, the, the bigger vehicles especially. So we would probably have to widen out our lane some even with autonomous vehicles. But there's certainly a, an opportunity to save some pavement if this is the direction it heads. And then if we look in um, more of an urban setting, and depending on which model the, the public goes to or, or however it's influenced, uh, are we each going to own our own autonomous vehicle? Are we going to share autonomous vehicles such that there's a big parking lot near some area and when you just take out your app and you say, I need a ride at 7.30 this morning to get to work and the car comes and picks you up and you just walk out and you get in that car? 
if we go to that model where we're sharing the vehicles, is that going to eliminate the need for a lot of parking in urban areas? Because we're not going to park if that car will drop you off, it'll go back to some shared lot and you need to, when you're done shopping, come pick you up. So maybe we can then start to narrow down our, our roadway within the urban areas. If we're living in a house, do we still need a driveway if we don't have a car? It's going to eliminate a lot of driveway conflicts. Well, we're aware that there's some of these vehicles that are being tested on our roads right now. And uh, I mentioned before that they're probably going to be mixing in with our traditional vehicles. There's probably going to be some sort of uh, dedicated lanes for them, such that, they name our, that we allow them in uh, specific lanes on, on hot highways. So if we do have these dedicated lanes for the connected and autonomous vehicles, uh, we need to take a look at how do we keep the traditional vehicles out of those lanes? How do we set locations that the autonomous vehicles gain access to those lanes? How do they get out of those lanes? What kind of buffer then do we have between these autonomous vehicles and the traditional vehicles? Is it just a painted stripe? Is it a concrete barrier? Is it some sort of delineator? How wide does it need to be? So there's a lot of different decisions that uh, need to be investigated that are I would say related to geometric design. And when we are in these situations where we're able to cut down on our shoulders, are these vehicles smart enough to sense when there's water on the road and then either slow the vehicle down or not even be in that lane? Is it going to change the way we design for the spread of uh, the rainwater and our inlet spacing? Is there that a potential that we could cut down on the number of drainage structures? Do we still need to have some sort of shoulder if the vehicles are sensing that they're going to break down or they blow a tire and they realize they are broken? Do we have to have some place for them to pull over such as a shoulder? Or are they able to maneuver in some other fashion to get out of the way? I mentioned roadside safety before. These vehicles are all able to stay on the road and they're able to keep their drift down and they're able to stay in their narrow lanes. Do we even need to have guardrail and attenuators and crash wall and concrete barrier and cable median barrier? Who's going to hit it? Why would they be leaving the road? Do we consider shy lines anymore? We may not need to. I don't think a car is going to care how close it is to something. Now, as we move forward with this, is there something that we need to know from the manufacturers in our design? What, is there something special that we have to put along that road, such as a special stripe, or does it have to have a certain sign to find itself and to stay where it needs to be? So if we don't need these things, there's a potential huge cost savings in eliminating these safety devices. And if we don't need the safety devices, can we build steeper side slopes? Just as long as it holds the road up, is that sufficient? Maybe it is. It's something that we'll need to think about. And if we're saving all this money, is there something else that we need to spend the money on so this technology will work on our roads? Do we have to have a very smooth pavement surface so that we're always maintaining our roads to have a very smooth surface? Or do we have to have very, very good striping? Or do we have to have certain sensors that we may or may not know about yet placed at certain locations along our road for these cars to work properly? Do we need to spend more money on cybersecurity for the vehicle so that nobody's going to hack them? And then we have construction. We're still going to be fixing roads and building roads. How are these vehicles going to get through the work zones? Is there something that we need to do so that these vehicles can better understand a work zone and get through it? So again, maybe it's has to do with the stripes or sensors or something that we as engineers need to design into our plans for our traffic control. 
And then is there, certain, is there a different type of geometrics that we would follow for our, our criteria for our work zone? Or is it just gonna be the same thing as the, the regular road? Now there's going to be some vehicles that maybe they won't go autonomous. So I've, I've listed some here. Maybe the, you probably don't have a lot of snow plows around here, but the, the people plowing the snow off the road, is that gonna be an autonomous snow plow? The person that's going out and maintaining the road or clearing debris off the road, is that gonna be an autonomous vehicle or is that gonna be a, a driver and someone moving the stuff off the road or cleaning it up or fixing the pothole? Or what about our emergency vehicles? Are they gonna be autonomous as well or will the police and ambulance, fire trucks, will they still have drivers? And then in a, an urban area, the garbage trucks, the buses, Will those have drivers or will those be driverless as well? So I think that there's the potential that we may for a long time have some vehicles that are gonna have a driver and we're gonna to have to be able to accommodate that within our designs. So there seems to be a lot of opportunity to make some changes, but we have to make sure that we're designing for the appropriate driver or quote non-driver. So what's next? Well, we can be real proactive about this, or we could be reactive, and probably both will work, but if we're proactive, we as engineers will have more say in this. So we need to have a good dialogue with the manufacturers so that we can understand what they're doing and what they need from us, and by George, maybe we can help them, and it won't be too painful for us. And we might not even know what those things are yet. But we need to be ready, and either way that we go here, uh, we need to make sure that we're following the, the, the policies and laws and rules of our respective uh, uh, territories, states, and such, because it impacts the, our work as engineers. And that's what I had for you today. <laughs>